What's the difference between a genetically modified tomato and a non-genetically modified tomato? So this is a fundamental issue. What is the difference? Those in power basically are saying, don't worry. The genetically engineered tomato is exactly the same as a non-genetically engineered. See, it's red, it's red, it's juicy, it's juicy. They're all the same. Eat it. It's called equivalence. And this is a very, very fundamental question that very few people understand. The scientists were saying, oh, see, they're exactly the same. See, they got green, they got green, they got a smiley face, smiley face. They're red, red. Look, they're exactly the same. In 1976, Gerald Ford signed a bill called substantial equivalence. So what they did was substantial equivalence was, oh, okay, you got a white stethoscope and you got a black stethoscope. If you can prove they're still the same, the FDA will fast track it. So that was done for medical devices. So when genetically engineered soybean comes into the market, the numbnuts in Congress, they said, oh, now we have genetically engineered soy. How do we get this approved through the FDA? And these guys say, oh, let's use that substantial substantial equivalence document that was used for medical devices. Now, remember, a medical device only has like five or 10 parts, 20, maybe 100. How many parts does soybeans have? They have hundreds of thousands of parts. The parts are all those molecular pathways. Now, remember, you have people who don't study, who sat in the back of the room, whose mama and papa let them go to school for free. They paid off someone to write their essays. These people get it all hand fed to them. They never have to work. So they said, oh, soybean, it looks like that. So, yeah, yeah, let's use substantial equivalence. So the FDA, based on the lobby, and based on Congress, allowed substantial equivalence to be used as the basis for getting a GMO soy substantially equivalent to a non-GMO soy. And who got to decide that? Monsanto. Monsanto said, okay, this soy is round. It weighs this much. It's got this much water content. And our non-GMO has that much. Great. It's equal. Let's get it through. They define the characteristics of equivalence. When I got into this, I said, wait a minute. You have to go to the fundamental issues to understand how this is different. And again, no one had done this at the time. Even the people in the non-GMO movement didn't even know what substantial equivalence was. They were just out there, oh yeah, we're against GMOs, we're against GMOs, because, why, uh, because, uh, why, because, uh, because Monsanto's evil. Okay. So many of you know, I developed a very powerful technology called Cytosol and using Cytosol, which came out of PhD work where we could model very complex systems. I said, what is the difference? And we found out that you will have 230% less glutathione in the Roundup Ready soy. So how did we do this? You know, I'm running for president. I encourage you to donate and volunteer cheaper for president.com. And donation means when you give any money, five, 10, whatever dollars you want to give, I actually give you books. I give you access to many, many courses. I cannot take money from you without giving you something back. And we've always done that. But go to shivaforpresident.com, donate or volunteer, or just go to truthfromhealth.com and become a warrior scholar and get all this knowledge. So what is the difference? What I did was I started looking at all the literature written on, for example, so I mined which side of all of these literature. By the way, no one paid us for this research. No one funded us. Didn't get one penny while I'm running my company. I did this as a noble service. Why? Because my grandparents were farmers. I never saw genetically engineered foods. I care about my health and I care about your health. And I could see there was something seriously wrong. We didn't start a nonprofit and beg people for money. I just went and did it. All right. So the first paper I wrote was I looked at all this and I went through 600, 837 experiments in 23 countries. And I built the first systems architecture of C1 metabolism. I wanted to find out how plants function. Every plant in the universe sequesters carbon and it uses carbon as a machinery to do this very interesting metabolic pathway. Methionine is synthesized, which goes through a methylation cycle. And by the way, this generates formaldehyde, which is toxic. It's a waste product. And every plant is doing this sort of engine. And then the formaldehyde in a normal plant is detoxified. There's something in there called glutathione. But every plant in the world uses a C1 metabolism pathway. So I discovered this engine by going through all of this. And I discovered the molecular pathways of methionine biosynthesis, documented that, discovered the methylation cycle, which is this red here, discovered the formaldehyde detoxification classification pathways. And I published a paper on that very quietly in the Journal of Agricultural Sciences. So the first paper I did, we didn't get funded. I did this because I wanted to do the fundamental research. We analyzed all these papers and we built the first systems architecture. And I published this in a journal, a peer reviewed journal. By the way, Monsanto was published in this journal. And after I published some fools said, oh, this journal is not a good journal. Uh, well, Monsanto was published in there too. Okay. So we published this paper. No one said anything. This journal basically said, hey, these are the molecular pathways of plants. The next Next thing I did was using cytosol, I took all of these molecular pathways and I mathematically modeled it. I wanted to find out what happens when C1 metabolism happens in plants. 
what are the fundamental variables that really distinguish plant metabolism? So when I ran this through, I found out something interesting. There's a very important nutrient. In fact, you have it in your body. It's called glutathione. It's the most powerful antioxidant. And in a normal plant, the glutathione levels are maintained at a beautiful steady state level. Formaldehyde is created, but then it gets consumed because glutathione levels are made. That's the antioxidant. Your body, for example, makes toxifying things and your body cleans it up, but you need glutathione. So this was a normal case. No one had any problem with this. I did sensitivity analysis and we published that in another journal called the American Journal of Plant Sciences in silico modeling of those pathways. No one said anything. Everyone was fine. Did it on my own while running other companies, while being an activist. Again, this was done on my off time, staying awake until two, three in the morning, doing this with our science team. Next, what I did was I said, okay, what happens when plants undergo stress? Just like you undergo stress, plants also can undergo stress. What is stress? They get drought, right? Maybe they get hit with pesticides, right? Maybe they don't get proper food. So that's when a plant undergoes oxidative stress. It typically happens when drought occurs, right? Plants don't get enough water or something happens in the environment. That is called a stressful condition. They're under oxidative stress. So I looked at those pathways. So here you have the methionine synthesis pathways, and I looked at the oxidative stress pathways and I identified three of those subsystems where reactive oxygen species get created. You have lipid peroxidation and you have ascorbate glutathione pathways. And I connected them together. This is a systems approach. So we had done this in the two papers on the right, and this was my new understanding. And what I noticed is when I put all of this together with Cytosol, which is, by the way, technology that I created for humankind out of my PhD work, and we gave it away for free here, we noticed that in the normal case, glutathione levels are the green line. But when plants undergo stress, guess what happens? Their glutathione levels get depleted. Everyone see that? They go boom down. That's the red line. Normal case. So when a plant's undergoing stress, just like when you're under stress, your body depletes its glutathione. That's why it's very important to... If you're under stressful conditions, eat N-acetylcysteine. Make sure you're supporting your glutathione levels, okay? And guess what happens? Because your glutathione levels drop, the plant, or not you, the plant doesn't have enough glutathione to detoxify itself and formaldehyde levels will go up. And I did sensitivity analysis and same here. So and under all different conditions, glutathione level goes up. So let me repeat, when a plant is under stress, glutathione levels will drop, formaldehyde will go up because glutathione is needed to detoxify. Everyone following? All right, so we published that. That third paper published, boom, no one said anything. People thought it was a great paper. Again, we published this in the American Journal of Plant Sciences, a peer reviewed journal. Now, having done this, I was curious, okay, so I published my first, I understand the me metabolic pathways. I've shown what happens under the normal condition. I've shown what happens with oxidative stress. What happens when a plant gets genetically modified? What happens when Monsanto went in and inserted that gene to create, let's say, Roundup Ready Soy? What did it do at this molecular level? Again, no one had done this research. Should probably get the Nobel Prize for this, but we won't get it because we're not, because Nobel Prize Committee loves Monsanto. So what I noticed was when you do genetic modification, I'd found independent research saying that four enzymes are upregulated during genetic modification, catalase, superoxide dismutase, glutathione reductase, ascorbate peroxidase, and one oxygen, reactive oxygen species. So these four chemicals are increased during genetic modification. When I plug those things in to our oxidative stress model, connected to our C1 metabolism model, put it all together, voila, look what we see here. We see that in the non-GMO condition, plants produce formaldehyde, and guess what? It gets depleted, right? This is a normal case. But guess, look what happens in the GMO case. Formaldehyde increases. Why? Because of plants in the non-GMO case, which had glutathione are being depleted. So what I had shown here was when genetic engineering takes place, the plant is literally as though it's being under drought. It's freaking out. And so the glutathione levels drop to a lower level. And this is why it's my view that whenever they create genetically engineered seeds, they have to coat them with neonicotinoids because because if they were to plant the normal seeds, they get eaten up by the soil organism. This is no different than a bodybuilder getting injected. He looks big, but he's actually weak. His nuts have shrunk. In this case, the seeds are weak. So then not only do they have to do Roundup Ready Soy, then they have to do genetic modification. Then they coat the seeds. And by the way, the neonics get into the plant and they kill the bees. That's a whole nother story. But you can see the level of idiocracy that's going on here. But anyway, this was then published. Now, when this got published, this is when the bomb went off because I was showing that genetic engineering lowers 
glutathione levels increases formaldehyde levels. And when this came out, boom, I started getting attacked. No one attacked the first three papers. When I showed this, you have the people at Cornell, you have the people in the European Union, everyone started attacking. Oh, this research is just modeling. It is, it's, it's not true. It's just, it's all bullshit. It's just modeling. It's modeling. What I then did was I said, okay, I'm going to compare our results with if I could find greenhouse results. And I was very lucky. A group in England had literally grown Roundup Ready soy plant in a greenhouse, which means the plant, which was a modified genetically engineered soy plant and the organic soy. We had used our models and we found out that you will have 230% less glutathione in our mathematical models predicted that you would have 230% less glutathione in the Roundup Ready soy. And when we published that, people said, oh, this is bullshit. Well, guess what? We were very fortunate. We found this paper. By the way, this came out in another paper called Plant Physiology by the American Society of Plant Physiologists, where these people in Leeds had found that when they grew the soy plant in vivo, which means in the soil, that the organic soy plant had 9.9 .9 levels of glutathione and the transgenic Roundup Ready plant had 3.7. You see, it's 230% less. And look what we found. Same thing. And voila, our results concurred with their results. When this came out, you saw absolute silence in the industry and no one has popularized this. And this was done over a series of five to six papers. So you guys, you understand, you're looking at someone who's an activist and who can get his hands dirty, do the research, and then we did major demonstrations. So from the activism to the research to getting on the ground, that is a real human being. And that's what you deserve. You know, I'm running for president. I encourage you to donate and volunteer cheaper for president.com. And donation means when you give any money, five, 10, whatever dollars you want to give, I actually give you books. I give you access to many, many courses. I cannot take money from you without giving you something back. And we've always done that. But go to cheaper for president.com, donate or volunteer, or just go to truthfromhealth.com and become a warrior scholar and get all this knowledge.